We're back, everyone. And we've got our guest, uh, Dr. Robert Geiker, a.k.a. Dr. G. And he is uh, uh, been uh, enjoying Hades with us. Uh, and now it's time to uh, uh, get into the formal interview portion of our uh, of our episode. You know what? I got to hold on. I'm going to switch to actual lighting here. All right, here. Now it seems more like we're in the room together and I'm not in uh, Elysium, but <laughs> Dr. G is yeah, here. I know you can't you can't see the you can't see the stream but Dom was like pink purple. Yeah, I was I was oh, very okay. pink because of yeah. the cool lighting he's got on the stream. Well, uh, um <laughs> yeah. It'll uh here, 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 here. It'll come back. It'll come back later. I'll say that. But that's a bit of a that's a bit of a teaser. Let's get into the actual interview. Uh you know, I normally say okay. uh I normally say thank the sleuths uh these uh, are put together by the Folkwise Interview Sleuths, but I can successfully say Daisy put together these questions this week. So everyone. Wow, well, you and I, we did ladders, two more. Ladders for Daisy. So, yeah. Ladders for Daisy. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Dr. G, if you, uh, if, if you, uh, uh, if you like a question, uh, make sure to specifically thank Daisy about it. So uh, you want to get into okay. your, uh, you want to get into your questions tonight? Yeah, yeah, let's let's go for it. Okay, let's start off um in the representation of mythologies in video games. How are the players and developers retelling a myth together? Hmm. How they're um they're they're co-creating. I think that's the key word I would use is is a mm. it's a co-creative act. Um I think it it varies from case to case. Um I think uh, there's some some games that are you know well thought out and planned, designed ahead of time, as we're seeing with games like Hades, where the co-creation is probably a little le uh, more, let me say, latent. Um, but then there's games that are more in dialogue, um, and I think the one that comes to mind to me is the most co-creative that I've kind of experienced has been Eve Online where the game kind of started off, or the world of EVE Online, which takes place in New Eden, um, it started off as a very kind of like the developers trying to really usher people into what is New Eden, um, the the advanced society of humanity existing in some kind of post-Milky Way um, universe and really trying to get them immersed in the science fictional um, world. Over time, players really kind of absorbed the game and really uh, kind of um, appropriated it for their um, for their own uses, and I think that over time the developers really caught on to that, and they let the players start to unfold the history of of that particular world. And I find that that's a has been one of them like the, the real um, insightful kind of uh, virtual uh, field site of of my work. I think that's where I saw that um, when developers really kind of I mean they're also kind of infamous for kind of um, being a little s slower in developing some of their content, but when they when they do, there's this really nice uh, synergy that happens between players and and developers. Um, one game that's not necessarily in my uh, study at the time. Um, let's see, uh, Warframe. I think it's Warframe. They've been also pretty good about doing that as well. They kind of um, they they co-create, and even some of the developers' voices are some of the players in the in the in the game so they voice the npcs so um yeah i think there's there's one way to look at it is that the myth is coming kind of like from top down and then there's the more of the vernacular level of the players kind of taking on the game world and try to move it into their own directions and some of their own interests um it's it's that kind of e word i guess it kind of floats around sometimes the emergent behavior that happens <laughs> So uh, it supposedly yeah. floats I mean, around it's... on this show too, but who can say? Mm -hmm. um, we see, almost named a horse Zelda there. Emergence. Emergence, yeah. We named her Motifa. Well, instead. actually, while we're, we I guess, while we're on that particular, instead. while we're on that particular word, what's interesting about the Eve Online um, kind of mythology is that in the the Eve Lopedia, which sort of had its own mm. kind of life on on the line, that they had to, it was first made by players trying to make sense of the world. So mm. the lore kind of, they didn't really usher out all of the lore all at once. It was in fragments. So 
players started to develop these kind of wikis to try to grapple with it. Um, one of my one of my uh, um, um, collaborators um, in this has been um, Mark Seven Twenty. He was um, someone who I worked with, uh, spoke with. Um, he's a he's a he's all about the 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 lore in that game. He's kind of like the the Eve lorist in a way of within the world. So we're talking about in in world of of um, New Eden. So I really have to um, um, give some uh, credit for the amazing work that he does. He does like an Eve travel um, blog. Um, but when you think about what the world of New Eden is about, it's it's humanity going through the Eve gate, um, and it's in some ways it's while we're ascending as a uh, you know kind of interstellar species um, in this sort of science fictional setting, we're also emerging so it does have a sense to from from my sensibility of uh um of how the world building takes place is that it's it is sort of like an emergence myth even though it's kind of uh taking place as sort of an ascendance so it it's kind of like those collections of of myths in our in our southwestern region of of north america where we have different variants of Mm -hmm. um what's might be called collectively the the emergence myth but really there's emergence myths there's no yeah. kind of m you know monolithic category of what the emergence myth needs to be like a checklist it's more like um different cultures use use a kind of a um or, or at least think through their creation as sort of not being necessarily creation but through emerging through from one world to the next yeah and that kind of implies a cosmology that worlds are stacked on each other the, I, I always think of like the fourth world. That's what mm -hmm. comes to mind when I hear that. If any, if that sounds familiar to anyone in the chat. Fourth, yeah, fourth world of the of the Hopi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from Greg Shrimp's class, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you can you actually say a little more about uh like what the what the of uh, the the lore of Eve Online is? And I, I want to say first, I, I love the way you described it. You know, like a uh, emergence and like uh. Uh, you know, like trying at first, it started off as like trying to make sense of of the world, which, you know, sounds sounds like myth or sounds like folklore in a way. But uh, what are, what are some like uh what are some of like your favorite details from Eve Online that made it such like a a, a special way of telling a story or creating a myth? One thing is that they're always looking for innovative ways to. Um... Um, when I say they, I, I would say uh, CCP, which is the developer mm -hmm. um, based out of Reykjavik. Oh. They um, they do kind of like they they were testing um, sort of cross platform experiments. Like they would um, release um, kind of like foot uh, kind of like foot soldier kind of FPS that would involve some kind of uh, trans platform. Um, coordination where players would experience maybe something happening in the PC version of EVE Online, but they would experience it in the uh, um, on the ground. I think it was like Dust Dust 514. It's a little it's actually uh, several years ago now. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little older experiment that they tried. Um, so I definitely like that they experiment. And I also like the fact that they really incorporate a lot of um, humanitarian work in there. Um, mm -hmm. They have the uh, um, uh sisterhood or sisters of eve uh that does a lot of um you know um wonderful uh philanthropic work there's also um they partner with universities sometimes to do the discovery projects which do things like scan for exoplanets so they what they do is they kind of rely on players or the capsuleers within the game to do a bit of research on say like a molecule or so cells that was like one of their older ones from a few years ago then they did a little bit of um, exoplanet scanning. So they're literally giving them real world data about exoplanets that we are huh. in the in RL, IRL looking for. And they kind of um, reward and provide a little bit of incentive for players to try to look for um, patterns in the data and also kind of reward them when they've done kind of, you know, decent analysis on it. That's a very interesting kind of approach where they kind of blur the line between what happens in world and IRL or in, yeah. in real life. So I always like their, um, you know, I really admire that aspect of their work. Um, so there's the, there's the four um, kind of tribes that was sort of part of the original um, vision of the, of uh, new Eden. 
uh, Gilente, um, Kaldari, uh, the Amar, and the Minmatar. And they're all different um, political ideologies. Mm. So they're kind of experiments in how, a, like it, when you join a, a, a tribe in, in the game, you sort of position yourself towards um, what's, uh, what kind of ideology you want to try to play out with. I think the, you know, the Galente, the Caldari tend to be um, kind of more corporate minded. Galente are sort of like very learned. They like to have universities more academic, I guess you could say. Sure. Um, the Amar and the Minmatar kind of tend to be a bit more, um, I think it's uh, the Amar tend to be a little bit more like re um, religious. Uh, so religiosity is pretty strong with them. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we're. That's, that's really cool. There's... That sounds like a, like, like a sort of like, uh, like, I don't know, almost like, like the case system or something. You know, like on the Indian, Indian mm. subcontinent, but it's like there's this whole like there's there's like a narrative precedent for the way like society is organized. That's right. interesting. And then they 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 um, use different kind of invasions of NPCs as well to kind of. So one thing to say for sure is that the game takes place within. Well, it's really like maybe a couple servers, uh -huh. uh, but there's shared servers within. Uh, there's a separate um server for china and then there's servers that are for um there's tranquility which is the server for um, most of um, the us and, and europe mm -hmm. and so players all exist in one one uh persistent shard um so there's um an active living economy in the game which i Ooh. think is also given um it, it also has i think the value of being a, a virtual world with with a with a history so it's been around yeah. since since 03 2003 um so slightly older than uh, world of warcraft and it's had this chance to really build a history um and players um really took to the the amount of room that they have to develop the uh, uh the, the history uh, the historiography of it mm -hmm. uh, so i a lot of scholars really look at how the economy works in it um uh, how it kind of plays out and they kind of study it so it's also been a wonderful uh kind of uh lab for looking for different scholars to look at it so what i tried to do anyways was try to think of it um in terms of you know what what kind of mythos or what kind of mythology are they considering here and i, I saw that it was ex it was very exemplary of what we would almost think of as that ethnographic way of looking at at myth is that it's it is a living a living reality that people are kind of tapping in dialing into um and the interesting thing was that in in their wiki entrance, and this is what really got got to me, uh, was yeah. because this takes place like thousands of years in the in our future, but we're kind of like living that future in the present. That there's uh, wiki articles about what is Earth, you know, what was on the other side of this Eve Gate, which is mm. in this sector of space called Genesis. So they really use their um, terminology. Um, the way that they the, the nomenclature of everything within the game is also has very very nice very subtle allusions like Gununga Gap from Norse myth or mm -hmm. ships are called Valkyrie or or ta uh, Tangu from uh, from Japanese lore so they they really do really subtle references too which I I always kind of admire which is I guess it's sort of very similar to other sci-fi worlds so one of the wiki entrances for what was mythology because just to be basic, I'm just like sniffing around in the in the wiki and seeing yeah. what they say. The comparative mythology that, uh, entry that they had in this uh, particular um, uh, Evelopedia entry I was looking at was like, well, what is Earth? Uh, where is where is Earth? Where is Milky Way and all that? And they use the language of comparative mythology to kind of get at this notion of this mythical place called Earth. So myth, so Earth becomes a mythic space or a mythic, mythic origins or a mythic place that nobody knows if it exists or not because it's they would have to go back into the Eve gate and try to figure out what's on the other side of it. So that's kind of what drives a lot of the, mis the, the mystique of the lore as well. Um, so it's almost like a post post human too. They, they, yeah. they like to play a lot with the language and the discourse of post humanism, transhumanism, cybernetic implants. Um, it's just, you know, I don't know. I just, I... Uh, I'm both a fan of the game, but I'm also, um, it seems to be one of the places where the game world is really like always feels very alive like yeah, I mean, it, no one, yeah it doesn't it doesn't tell you what to do you have to really forge your existence in it it's a very harsh i mean like i've 
I've kind of sniffed around in, in places I, sh I, you know, gone into, you know, um, uh, wormhole space, which is sort of like where there's zero, um, you're, you're basically at the risk of losing all your stuff. Um, so they have different sectors of space as well. So you could have safe, um, high sec or high security space, and then there's low sec, mm -hmm. which is like you're at the risk of being, you know, kind of your, your ship uh, that you fly around. Um, you could um, kind of lose your stuff. Uh, but once you enter into null sec, which is like the very kind of open waters, there's no um, yeah. concord, which is sort of like the admins, and they you could really just like you know if you're not watching, um, you could um, basically lose all of your um, your work and all of your um, your belongings and stuff. So I like I like the risk factor too. So it kind of um, it reminds me of when I finally took a trip to. Um, to Iceland uh, back in 2017. So this was after my uh, dissertation. Um, my wife and I went there for our uh, sort of like our our honeymoon of sorts. Uh -huh. And uh, but I got a chance to kind of see a little bit of uh, CCP. I got a, I got to um, oh, cool. talk with uh, one of the uh, the writers who I kind of um, worked with a little bit. Just um, so um, yeah, I'm, you're giving me such a good chance to really talk out a lot of this stuff. It's that so had a, interesting. Had a good yeah. out, outlet this for. Like, so this I just, is. Um... I wanted to. Yeah, I want to butt in and say that new guy neighbor is like going off in the chat. He's new guy neighbor so, earned he's that. One of our, our number one fans. New is guy like, neighbor earned that gift sub just it. now. He says this guy's awesome. He's quoting yeah, a lot of Battlestar Galactica, and it's making awesome. me chuckle. It's making yeah, he's making comparisons oh, yeah. to yeah. Battlestar. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean funny. the you know the um uh, he's, he's I admire both sides of, of the I really admire both sides of it. I, I admire what the players do with the mm -hmm. world and I admire what the developers do. Um, yeah. They do prime fiction, so and then they that which is like this the fiction that you can read within the game. Then there's the what the players do. So there is maybe about around 2015 or so. They did this sort of um contest to see who uh who's oh, i'm trying to think of what they called it it was something like eve tales or uh forgive me i'm being a bit absent-minded on this um but it was it was basically players trying to um uh, true stories that's what it was called true mm. stories and it became mm. when they chose the player uh, who kind of told retold their life as a capsuleer it became this sort of inner um well, first off, they 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 acquired a the Dark Horse um, publisher to kind of reimagine his, this particular player's um, experience and stories and, ev and events. So the cool. The other thing too is that the 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 debris of of battles, the scale of battles, which is what a lot of people hear about in it. That's is, what I um, know about you know, yeah. the thousands, the thousands of players, the all of the uh, all of the resources that go into those conflicts. Um, that once they once they're done, they kind of leave the, the developers decide to leave that debris in there. So it builds a history in the game, which I really That's so cool. You know, I really appreciate. So I kind of I frame it sort of like a myth history. So that's where I'm, that's the word I like to use. It's like somewhere caught between history and myth. Yeah. That, this is so fascinating. I think I literally could this listen. Very interesting. I literally could listen to you talk about Eve Online. Yeah, something I only know from I, well, I knew about like the wreckage of battles, and I knew about like the, the scale of the game and how long it's been on. But I really didn't know like you say like emergent myth, and I just think like an emergent myth, but on a plant like a galactic scale sounds so cool. Yeah, that's I incredible. Have to also, I also have to say that this notion that they use the history and the geography to tell the story is to me. Just as like an intuitive thing, I, I sense that there's so much of Icelandic identity in it. Oh so yeah, much Icelandic kind of feeling of how they how they um, kind of um, treat the the unfolding of it as if it's like saga in yeah. the proper sense of Icelandic saga. Mm -hmm. You know, um, tales of feuds of revenge of they want the travails of of you know different groups kind of in conflict with each other. Um, yeah, it's really like the stuff of Icelandic saga, so Iceland. All right, can we and, and the other cool if... thing uh, I have to say, um, go for it. I'm sorry, I'm just on a tangent. Sorry, um, go for it. Is that what's really cool is that their their currency in the game is ISK, which stands for inter uh, interstellar credits. I okay. Believe. Um, but ISK is also the krona, which is also what Icelandic currency is called too. So they do a nice little hmm. double reference in the game. Yeah. So. 
Um, new guy neighbor who's been going off in the chat asks if it's worth <laughs> getting into Eve now. Like today. Oh worth, yeah, like, you know, like people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would, I would not. I, I would say yes. I mean, anytime, just you know, jump, jump into it. Um, they, they really kind of lowered a bit of a, uh, a little bit of an entry to it because they, it used to be that you had to um kind of pay the monthly fee for mm -hmm. certain, but now you can kind of get into it through a um there's like right, well currently right now i'm sort of between the omega so you can enable your omega account which kind of lets you have full oh, access cool. and then if you don't you're kind of like in a in a bit of a you know gap of 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 a subscription um and you can but the other thing that's interesting about it is that you can um you know as you kind of immerse yourself in the economy of the game you can earn enough uh to invest in um uh Plex, which is sort of like the pilot's, uh, let's see what they call it, pilot's license extension. Um, so Plex can be purchased, and Plex allows you to have a month of, it used to be a month of the game itself. Mm -hmm. And then now it's like probably like a pace for like the Omega. But you can also trade. So you can trade your Plex with other players. Huh. And Plex always is kind of on the ascendance. It's always, it's it's expensive That's in the, in the game. Fascinating. Um. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I was going to go on so much about. Oh, it. Hey, games, well, you want to you want to really you want to move on to a different uh, a different video game then. Oh, um, you know, I'm up. I'm up for. All right, so I hear you talk. About, I hear you talk about this all the time. It's in your dissertation a little bit. You talked about it when you uh, did like hmm. the uh, uh, like the dress rehearsal with us the other night, um, and I've tried not to ask or read anything about it because I'm waiting for this explanation on stream, but. Oh, okay. How is Catherine a modern mythic text? Oh. Mm -mm. <laughs> I would probably rephrase one of the key words in there. Maybe it's like, say it's like a modernist. Oh, modernist. Text. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Go Maybe off. that would be like my new, because, you know, I realize um, there's, you know, you guys actually gave me a chance to kind of revisit my dissertation because I kind of didn't really look at it for a while. Um, Hell yeah. And uh, I am going through a phase of, um, as you guys probably know, as you know, fellow um, fellow academics, as, yeah. we, as we often do sometimes, we go back into the work and we see what can be kind of yeah. um, advanced and moved forward. So I try to do that right now. So I have a few um, different articles that have kind of taken on a life of their own. So it actually means sometimes that I don't really necessarily look too much at dissertation work Fair. so much as I get I get caught up in my my latest sort of um, thesis or or study. But the Catherine game is one that I'm kind of circling back to because I feel like that particular chapter deserves sort of like its own separate treatment. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's one that can uh, that I'm trying to uh, revise. It's almost restructured at this point. So cool. um, how much how much of this is blurred with what I've done with it? now as opposed to what's in the dissertation i can't i don't know if i'll be able to make that distinction um i wouldn't notice but i do think that what they try to do atlas did with catherine is is introduce um especially um the the, the um uh the, the the writers for the game i think that they they really uh, to really give catherine its proper context it exists within the uh Megami Tensei world. Yep. So it's there is I think in like Persona two or three, Vincent who is the protagonist of of uh, Catherine, is um is kind of like in one of the bars. So you get to talk to this guy called Vincent who's kind of like, kind of drinking on his own, a little depressed. And you get to figure out who Vincent is when you get to 2011's Catherine. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way that you kind of interact with uh divinities like supernatural figures kind of like the um the catherine with a c who becomes you realize later in the game that she's uh she's a succubus and that she's being uh sort of employed by the Muzi, who is the or tamuts who is the bartender um so it's it's to me it has a sensibility of modern it, it uses modern guys to reveal ancient myths and mythic cycles mm. that we would know as sort of like the Inanna descent or uh, the relationship of the goddess and the consort um, that we see in figures like 
um, Venus and Adonis or Addis and Kibele or um, uh, in this case, um, Inanna and uh, Tammuz or Ishtar and Dumuzi, if you like. Yep. So it's it shows these kind of pairs that then shows how it echoes in your average Joe's life. So him uh -huh. and his consorts, and it's and it's uh, you know it, up to the player what they want to do with those endings. They want to do they want to remain sort of um, with their Catherine with a K who has been his kind of, um, they've, they've been in their uh, relationship. She's their, uh, his fiance, but they want to stay committed. And he's like about 32 or so. So he, they're kind of both at that age where they're just like, do we, should we settle down? And he's kind of going through that crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so comes along this sort of anxiety that's produced out of the figure of, of um, Catherine with a C who kind of shows up as this sort of, um, you know, the, uh, the, the tempting uh, feminine, and then, um, you know, one, I have to say, um, I'm waiting to necessarily wrap up that paper, the, the revised version, because it's, um, you know, full body has come out. Yeah, now. So I have to kind of factor in and I have to sort of revise and update accordingly to know what's going to, you know, what's what's happening with that third um, or the, really the, the, uh, the, the other um, um, figure who kind of comes into the story. So, um so when I say uh, modern mythic text, I'd say maybe modernist mythic text. He uses a mythification. Process. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I would say. I like that. Um, another question there, for you. There was a bad joke. Oh, oh God, wait, say, it, Daisy, joke, say um, it, Daisy, That uh, New Guy Neighbor uh -oh. made in the text. Um, the, there's okay. a question involving it, too. So the question is, have you played the Fallout series? And then New Guy Neighbor elaborates and says he'd probably get a Rads bonus having built in Geiker counter. Probably I'm the first sorry, time I he's heard to, that one. Yeah, great it. job, Neighbor. It was a pun. <laughs> so, yeah, um, really I, good. I have yeah, to be, thanks, Neighbor. <laughs> I have to be up front. Um, uh, Fallout, I have not, unfortunately, given some attention to. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ooh. Just being up front. I mean, I, I wish, you know, really I should probably, I, I should definitely, I, I'm going to take that as a... There's uh, only so many games. Yeah. There's you know, so that's the thing. We're living in a... Play. There's an abundance. Like, um, that's that's the nature of game research also. I think, uh, um, you know, it's finding it's finding the time. And also, you want to make sure that you do proper um, proper analysis, I would say, too. Um, I've I've read some works that really kind of jump around and kind of uh pick and uh choose different little selections of games just to but sometimes i really like when i just choose you know some of my favorite um uh, explorations is when i just choose a single game and i just try to go down the rabbit hole of that game mm -hmm. and just um that's where i get a lot of the the joy out of the research of it um mm -hmm. so sometimes it means that about i don't shock now Bioshock, I've started. Bioshock yes, uh, yeah. Bioshock, I've. Um, I didn't necessarily incorporate that in there, but I do know that there's there's really some great great lore about that world. Mm -hmm. um, that means that I have to get into things about like um, Ayn Rand is. Yeah, exactly. Like that's that. a whole other. So, yeah. I, know, I know. Yeah, I know. That's a that's a whole yeah. other beast that I'd have to like kind of factor in. All right. Um, I I do like the older. I'll tell the, the chat to that, calm the... down. We could. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, chat, calm like, down. There's get, only so listing. many games. He has yeah, a chat, kid and a job. Calm down. We can list every every single game. Okay. <laughs> let me. Let me okay. We, we got so can I? Can I? Stuff to talk about. Can I pivot? Can I pivot away from from games real quick? I do like System Shock. Yeah. I mean, I started. Oh, I like System okay. Shock, which is the older one, and now they've kind of remade it so many times. That, yeah. Um, I do want to try some of the latest ones. I, uh, I'm, I really like uh, the System Shock world and Deus Ex, and that's kind of. Prior the, the older kind of cyberpunk games, I'm really yeah. a huge I'm a huge fan of cyberpunk. So, so getting getting off. I'm sorry. Uh, there's probably so many directions we could go. So. How how does the legacy of Joseph Campbell influence your work, mm -hmm. if oh, it okay. does at all, oh, sure. or like how do you speak against, speak with it or against it, or like how does that oh. how has that work influenced your scholarship? Because and people have a lot of different opinions and thoughts about it. And so I was just curious. Yeah. No, I mean, like, actually even getting into, um, you know, the history of the, the study of myth. I mm -hmm. mean, he has a very complex 
relationship um to yeah. it uh you know i'm i'm also i'm i'm one who kind of holds a bit of this sort of contradiction of sorts um i really admire alan dundas's work and anyone who's spent any time with alan dundas's work knows that he <laughs> uh you know i mean he's he's gone to task um there's a really strong afs presidential um, yeah delivery that he gave yeah. back in like 04 2004 and you know um i would say that i sort of fall somewhere in the middle i'm not going to go like pro or con it's more like he is a factor in pop culture and how people have come to conceptualize what myth is um and i and i want to kind of recognize that and i think that uh you know say you know i know that there's criticism against sort of like his model of the monomyth um and how it's uh, sort of appropriated a lot of different kind of folk narrative genres and created this what what dundas called a synthetic composite mm -hmm. um and scholars prior to that have kind of gone into um uh, you know which which campbell didn't really necessarily cite like um lord raglan's work and um otto ronk who also did work on heroes um but i would say that there's you know, there's pluses and minuses to to the lay of the land of of the literature. I think sure. that there's there's tremendous values. I think in some of his four functions of myth, which have to do with like cosmological functions, sociological function, the psychological, um, which is kind of like the pedagogical, the metaphysical. There's aspects of his work that I think kind of speak to um, the world building aspects of myth. But I also know that you know, um, I. I admire so much of of what other mythologists who kind of specialize in in very specific narrative traditions and what they've done. Um, yeah, Alan Dundas's work or what he's done with it. Um, well, our one of our contemporaries, uh, Toke Thompson. I think he mm -hmm. does really tremendous work. Who's also kind of partnered with uh, Greg Shrimp on some work. Yep. Uh, you know, recently I think there's like uh, another good pair that kind of bring into this. I think is. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien and our own folklorist uh, Barry Tolkien. <laughs> uh, those two kind of show different sides of how to, uh, you know, one is very much steeped in um, the ethnographic context of yep. of a myth uh, of of a mythic tradition of a myth telling tradition. When you have access to actual myth tellers, that changes the game of how you even think about myth. Yeah. Um, and then you have someone who's like Tolkien, who's kind of also left this legacy in our, um, you know, in our fantasy, um, high fantasy RPGs. And you see that mythopoeia can be kind of something of, of, of value, sort of, which kind of gets into um, more of the realm of Märchen or the world of the, of the wonder tale. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like I can... I'm going in all my, my my mind is now starting to go in all sorts of different directions. Oh, but uh, but it, um, it was no, worth that, it to get to Tol great. Tolkien versus Tolkien. Yeah, that great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a great binary. I think I like to you know I like to read against the I like to read against the grain of Campbell sometimes. I think he's he's good to think with in terms of you know am I am I going along something you know comparative work that kind of in line with it is or do I want to try to try something different like there's comparative mythologists like uh like wendy doniger yeah. and there's bruce lincoln and there's who've also kind of put out their notions that we need to kind of tailor the the comparative approach and to me like the something that i've i'm really trying to spend my my own kind of life work on is when i do comparison really try to get down to the linguistic comparisons of the languages so really maybe not try to compare more than like two or three at a time two cultures at a time to mm -hmm. really see if i can get down to core connections that they have in, in language um because then it, it's you know the the difficulties that we faced in in modernist uh 20th century um sorry i'm using such highfalutin words but like the the neo-romanticism that sometimes creeps in in 20th century work um, trying to create these kind of generalized theories universalist theories we realize now that we have to kind of go into that sort of more refined approach and really try to maybe be a bit bit more modest in what we're working on. Mm. Uh, um, those you, are just some of my thoughts that are occurring as I'm, you know. They're great thoughts. We have it on the show for the thoughts to occur live with chat. Um, do you mind, do you mind if I get into some, uh, some fun questions for you real quick? 
Oh, sure. Okay. Um. So what? 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 How did you move from art school to mythology? How did that transition happen? Um. Well, it really. I started at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. I was mm -hmm. in their um, fine arts program, uh, painting and printmaking. Um, and I, you know, as someone who was exploring philosophy and religions, um, I was kind of wanting to see how I could weave in some of those themes into my uh, creative work ah. uh, at the time. So that kind of led me into works like, um, not not just maybe like, Campbell's work, but just studying um, uh, Alan Watts. I was, I'm, a, I'm still kind of a really big fan of Alan Watts's writings in philosophy, mm -hmm. who has a very interesting life in games. Um, there's a game called Everything, which actually uses lectures of Alan Watts in his cool. in his work. Um, um, so then, as I was, um, you know, I was taking my art classes, and then, but I was also kind of. You know, during the summer, I'd take like a, a Milton class, John Milton class, just so I could have an excuse to read some Paradise Lost and um, maybe get some inspiration on some paintings I was I was working on. Uh, so and then it occurred to me that uh, I instead of going off and developing into an MFA, um, I had my skill set. Yeah. You know, I I, I have a, I had a very supportive aunt and uncle who who both were you know are tremendous artists and um, they they really inspired me to continue my my drawing and my painting and my graphical work. And then from there, I just decided that um, you know instead of an MFA and to kind of lock myself away in the studio and try to churn out some some work, I was just like you know my artwork is going to come and go in my life. It's just something that I want to have a different relationship to. I wanted to tap more into what would be the themes that I'd want to grapple with in my work. Yeah. And that was really the simple, the simple notion that I had that, you know, mythology, specifically world mythologies um, in relation to their world religions and folklore and that, that they, that, that myth is always, it, mythologies always kind of bring in a, a gestalt of all of that. They kind of show a culture's mm -hmm. philosophy in a graphical language. Um, they're very visual. It's kind of a very visual um, even though it sometimes is delivered in a verbal art form, it can also stir um, imagery. Um, so I, I, you know, I had the notion and I seeked out my um, master's PhD program at Pacifica and I just, I just, I went for it. Cool. And then along the way, I met amazing um, scholars who kind of um, get were specialists in their own in their own right. We had folks who were uh, foc focused on um, Hindu and Buddhism. My supervisor, um, uh, who I eventually uh, I invited her on, um, and luckily she wanted to join. Laura, uh, Dr. Laura Grillo, mm -hmm. she did amazing. She does amazing work in uh, African, uh, West African, Cote d'Ivoire um, areas, uh, divination systems, oh. um, and I. She she had a class on play and ritual, and so Ooh. I'm just like I th I think this is I I need to talk to her about this because I wanted to I wanted to kind of share this one little thing um, was that when I was in I was having a lunch with my uh, who was a girlfriend at the time now my wife um, <laughs> we were in we were in the uh, uh, the diner um, at VCU and uh, I I suddenly had this idea it's just like you know I I like this god game called uh, black and white. And I thought mm. to myself, like, how cool would it be if I, if we, if you could teach theology using black and white? So using a God game, um, got games that allow you to kind of feel what it's like to have that um, um, the power of almost like an om omnipotence and to try to you know um, inspire your villagers and all that. What the, the thought process of being in that kind of mode of of a deity, and and to kind of try to teach a religious course in that. And so that's kind of been an early inspiration and a germ of an idea that I'm still trying to figure out. I'm still f following that and seeing what happens. Yeah. Um, and that kind of led to some of my chapters. So I really feel very blessed and fortunate to have had a chance to explore that in my studies. So, um, and then along the way, I have to say that folklore um, really came in, um, especially during that uh, formulation of, of my dissertation um i was very fortunate to have a fellowship um at rochester in rochester at the uh, strong museum of play to kind of get a sense of oh, tangible cool. history of games 
And then I, I went to Finland um, and spent some time at, with the Folklore Fellows um, yeah. in 2015 during one of their summer schools. And we talked about digital folklore and working digitally with folklore, you know, mm. kind of like that back and forth. And that's where I got to meet people, you know, the whole host of uh, folklorists working in that area yeah. um, internationally. And so I've just, I've, I just feel very fortunate that that kind of world of folklore opened out and welcomed and, you know, welcomed my work. And it was, um, it was very, you know, I've been kind of just sticking with that and following it ever since. So I try to just keep an open, open mind. I, I, I understand criticisms of certain scholars and I always figure like, yeah, there's that. Yeah, they do have their downsides. And then they also have their contributions. And then in the end, we're, we all end up becoming our own sort of third party in the conversation. Um, one lesson that I really learned from Dr. Grillo was that she inspired me to seek out kind of like, you know, conversations beyond our institute, um, beyond our school, to just join in on conversations, especially in the literature itself in um, publications. So that's usually uh, she kind of imparted to me this feeling that scholarship's a conversation and that's that's always kind of stuck with me sort of like a little mantra just try to just um be a be a good conversationalist and um you know scholarship is sort of like that long very long conversation yeah very, it's just and just try to contribute where you can and push the conversation forward um that's also i think what, what i try to embody also with the uh work that I do with my journal, Cultural Analysis, which um, mm -hmm. Ted Thompson welcomed me on to, or I'm going on, on and on, sorry. I'm just realizing all these string of, string of uh, um, connections that I've, I've uh, gone down. This is, you know. This is a long, anyway. if, if scholarship is a long conversation, this is a long conversation, but a long conversation. So I think it's only appropriate. <laughs> oh. Yep. I got to ask this question uh, because it's very uh, near and dear to Daisy's heart. Uh, oh, okay. What's your favorite and least favorite thing about living on the California coast? Because uh, Daisy grew up like 30 minutes from Pacifica. I grew oh, up wow, in really? Ventura. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Ventura, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, very important question. <laughs> least favorite thing and favorite thing about the California coast. Wow. Okay. Uh favorite thing is just the amount of um wonderful food mm. all the, fo the food culture is is very strong here and um we're very fortunate to kind of live near um you know where where we're where we're nestled it's the weather is just beautiful <laughs> um, that's one thing um i would say the downside is i'm a i'm born and raised in new mexico so really i think the downside is that i'm just I'm not near my parents right now and I'm not near mm -hmm. my brother and my, my nieces, uh, my niece and nephews. Um, and I really wish my, my boy could, uh, you know, be hanging out with them and, and playing. So that's, that's probably the downside is just, uh, the familiar, uh, the, the distance from our family. I get it. So. Um, I think I'm going to ask, uh, one more question real quick before we, uh, move oh, okay. confidently into the, uh, uh, the fun and games part of the uh, uh, the interview, and if there's any other questions uh, that we have for Dr. Geiker, uh, Daisy, you want to get those now or after I ask this? Yeah. Um, there. I was looking through. There's not like a specific question, but um, Libby Tucker says, "Hey, cool. Glad you came over to focus." <laughs> <laughs> Libby Tucker, yeah. Oh my gosh yeah um i see um, and uh having legends fun college, yeah. I, oh my god yeah she uh yeah i have somewhere around here i have campus legends yeah great, great yeah. handbook great yeah handbook. absolutely yes um yeah having fun having fun who's also uh, a folkwise team member was like oh. just caught in right right under the wire for uh your interview because uh, she also went from visual art to folklore pipeline in kind of a different direction mm -hmm. but loves I the, would say, you know the transition oh, there man. <laughs> unfortunately the scholarship has led me so you know every once in a while i get a chance um to do like some cover art and to try to my my dream oh. someday is to maybe go back into um you know, do some cover cover art for 
you know, colleagues and that. I really would, I would love that. I mean, yeah. if, if, everyone, if anyone needs a cover art for something. Um, otherwise, um, you know, one day I'm going to get back into my visual work. Um, mm -hmm. But right now, this, this, I have to, I have to get this, you know, keep, keep my uh, the scholarship is sort of snagged to me and it's kind of, um, it's possessed me for the time being, but maybe later, later on when I can settle down a little bit. Well, I guess, I guess this question I wanted to ask kind of combines uh, both like folklore and uh, visual art. What is, mm -hmm. what is Vaporwave? How did, how did Vaporwave come to be and why is it so mm -hmm. folkloric? Wow. You're going into a paper that I presented. Oh, we uh, might be. Buffalo, we I might think. be. <laughs> wow. This is an extremely memorable presentation I saw you give at AFS. Daisy one talks about it all Macintosh, the time. Macintosh, let's see, Macintosh <laughs> Plus. Uh, that's somewhat of the origins. Mm -hmm. Actually, funny enough, the, 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 the person who kind of formed up it, I, I found that there was a very solemn origins to it. Um, I think. You know, if I, if I, I'm hoping I'm getting my history right here, but um, Mac, uh, Macintosh Plus, she, uh, the, uh, the original album that kind of spurned it all, um, it really, it came from a relationship between her and her father who was working at Microsoft, I believe. And it was like this distance, the distance that she felt from her father because of the, uh, how much the, the, him being involved in the tech industry was kind of taking him over and her distance from him. So it's kind of like that longing feeling. Yeah. So the fact yeah. that, that that 19, that Windows 95, that sort of 90s internet kind of aesthetic to it, that um, to me, there's something about how memory plays out in Vaporwave and the sound and the atmosphere, the kind of echoing and the repetition, something about folklore that's about the the reverberation of tradition and memory i feel like there's a there's a yearning for people who experience you know these kind of strange feelings of being in malls that are just kind of dying and there's this echoing music and it's just there's something in in the in in that that and how people share uh vaporwave that it's going on to live off in in meme culture internet mm -hmm. meme culture mm -hmm. it appropriates meme culture and plays with it um there's so much um interactivity that to me is more of an essence of almost like folk culture appropriating consumer culture yeah kind of yeah you know, um um wow it's really great that you remember that presentation uh daisy well uh this might be Get the ready yeah, get ready because this might be the crux of get ready of the last uh, thing we're doing. And uh, if you've, it sounds okay. like you've seen some of the shows, so I think you know what comes next. Uh, the question I love asking: mm. You ever made a tier list? I have. I have not. You have not. Uh, tier list, of no. course. Uh, it's the ranking. ranking yeah. List, yeah, like right? the ranking list. They come. They come from video games. It's like the. Uh, way to rank uh like character choice specifically in fighting games a lot Ooh. of the time but uh people okay. use them online to rank uh various choices in everyday life uh which i think makes it such mm. like a cool uh all kinds kind, of stuff kind of like folklorist tool that is to say uh we are coming through with a tier list for you right now which is oh boy uh, -oh. uh if you if you hit uh view, if you hit view stream there oh thank you oh, tommy I, do i have to do that or... no i uh, you you hit view you oh. hit oh my uh, gosh. you hit view stream tommy. oh my gosh tommy no the, the you hit view stream but dom will control the, the yep for you. basically <laughs> sorry You're, a bunch of no, things are happening tommy, have... tommy just gave us a bunch okay. of subs thank you thank oh you tommy gosh. no you don't have to you don't have to do anything you just tell me where it goes but Daisy and I have curated a tier list of internet aesthetics, and we were talking about sort of aesthetic uh, or art and music, uh, fashion, sort of, uh, 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 you know, um, movements that were sort of, sort of iconically online first, and we've you got- know, I feel like I wore, I wore the wrong shirt. <laughs> I have some shirts that I was I was so pleased to have found. I forget what no, it was. Think... A, where were they? What were they? Wonderful. I have some I have some wonderful vaporwave shirts that I I am so proud of, and I really wish I can't wait for the chance to present on it. Again, <laughs> so I can wear them. Uh, right now, I'm wearing my hot. Are you? Shirt, yeah. Are you looking yeah. at them? If you want to show, you we can pause. Yeah, that's cute. It's also good. 
Yeah, do you ha are they right uh, there? <laughs> mm, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, like maybe, maybe, maybe you can, you can, dip, you can, yeah, maybe you can dip out when we get back to Hades and come back with maybe. a new shirt. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Um, yeah, so, so here we've got about nine and, you know, S is master class, D is barely passing. Uh, why don't we start off with Vaporwave? Here we have a sort of, uh, like digital sunset and a, uh, uh, Windows 95 logo oh on a, on a column. Do I have to say what? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm being so, uh, do I have to click watch stream? Yes. So I can see? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yes. yes. There we go. Yeah. All right, so here we have we yeah. have some iconic. Now you can uh, see the tier list, and you can see we've got. Uh... I'll, oh I'll go through. I'll go through each one with you. But the first one we've got here, of course, because it just came up, was vaporwave. So, where do you rank vaporwave as an internet aesthetic? Oh well, I feel like that's gonna be top tier for the time being. Top tier is this kind of like a thing where I can modify yes, it as I go? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So S for oh, the time okay. being. Um, okay. Next up, n next up, we had a shout out from uh, from Anna uh, from Having Fun in chat. Anna? Next, uh, Having oh, Fun. Okay. Uh, Hi, next Anna. one we've got yeah, is C Punk, who Anna knows one of the main creators of C Punk. Uh, C Punk, yes, I've I've vaguely yeah I've I've um I think I've listened to some tracks from C Punk. We've got sort of palm trees, pineapples, and like a like a, a, a aqua berry yeah. pyramid here. Yeah. Where where do you uh, rank uh, C Punk? We'll put we'll put that. I mean, uh, we'll just say that's kind of second for the time being. Okay, I'm gonna okay. have to probably just kind of, you know. All right. Next next up here we've got a young woman in a in a poorly lit library in a cardigan, with uh, tons of books. We've got dark academia. Oh, dark academia. Dark academia. Yeah. Uh, I could. Yeah. Academe yeah, wave. In a, a, academe, an academe wave, an emerging <laughs> aesthetic of dressing like your professors. Uh, I don't know. That's not really. I'm not. I'm not vibing with that right now. So I don't I vibe like with it either, that. honestly. Um, I'm gonna okay. put that a little yeah. lower. Can we just B C where D D? So I was looking at uh, Dark Academia with Daisy. I'm just like, this is just how I dressed when I was getting my master's, and it's making me cringe. <laughs> Uh, next up, though, <laughs> next up, though, a fan, a fan favorite, uh, I think, in our chat, uh, okay. we've got Cottage Core. Cottage Core. Uh, I, I need to do something so I can see these a little clearer. I guess Cottage Core. Did you full screen the view stream? Oh uh, yeah, let me. I, let me I, see I trust here. that it. Trust it. If Oops. you full screen it or pop it out, it might look better. I trust that it looks, it's a little bit closer on, on the stream itself. Yeah, we've, it's here we've got a, a woman having oh, a I pastel, see. a woman having a pastel picnic with wicker baskets in a, in a field of like autumn flowers. I mean, I rank it, I mean, that seems to be a little above the academia. Uh, where are we putting that? Yeah. Let's just do C for now. C for, C for now. Um, and like the kind of cousin to... The cousin to uh, Cottage Core. Uh, here is a pile of shinies. That's right. We're talking about Goblin Core, the maximalist Cottage Core. More, uh, more fungus, more fungus than uh, plant life. But where do you put Goblin Core? Let's put that one above. So let's uh, go. go ooh, B. spicy take. Goblin Core has overtaken uh, Cottage Core <laughs> as of this year. Um, next, we've got Solar yeah. Punk. We've got we've got our Solarpunk. we've got our eco eco friendly utopian future of solar punk. Where does solar punk I... go? Oh boy, that one's cutting edge. It's like I feel like that's tapping into um what is it uh, something like uh, Elon Musk and and the the drive towards uh, yeah I think that one ranks a little higher than uh, yeah let's put that one over in like a uh above C punk. Or under C Punk? No, not above C Punk. Okay, C Punk. C Punk is just so iconic. Let's let those two battle it out, I guess. Right there. Next up, this is a. Uh, yeah. This is this yeah. is this is uh, a cool. this is someone in it uh, with like uh, fake freckles, uh, like done done on freckles with an oversized T shirt. This is baby and a padlock necklace, and uh, and uh, bags done in eyeshadow under their eyes. Yes, we're talking about e boy, e girl, e person. We're talking about e uh, we're talking about e boy. Ooh -woo. I like that. I like that. Um, let's put that one above solar. Let's well, 
let's continue to battle that out with on the A plane. Okay, yeah. this is somewhere in A. So is this going in the middle of the two? Yes. Yeah, that sounds good. Great, great, great. Last, uh, or right here, uh, I liked how you were talking about vaporwave as sort of like uh, folklore's. Uh, uh, how 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 did you describe vaporwave in that in that earlier question? I I wanted to remember um, it uh, so well, like folklore. It's, distribu uh, it's distributed and appropriated like by by individuals like and shared. So it's like folk culture appropriating of consumer. Yes, of folk consumerist nineties. Yeah. Folk culture co appropriating yes. consumerist nineties, but make it Eastern European. And I wore it just for the stream. That's right. We're talking about Gopnik. Oh, wow. So, where are we putting Gopnik on the stream? Gopnik. Like, sort of the the Eastern European uh, uh, shadow of Vaporwave. The, uh, oh, yeah. Boy. Track suits. Folk, folk culture appropriating yeah. uh, commercial suits. culture, but you're you're drinking a handle of vodka in a tracksuit. Oh, my gosh. I, I like that. Um, let's um, put it up there with, uh, on, uh, in red. Oh, where is that? The S? Low S? Is that so so you yeah. low, I, I like yeah. that as like sort of the duality of like the uh like the yeah folk culture of appropriating uh like hot, like uh late capitalism and appropriating like uh post uh Soviet. Bubble, yeah that, that's, bubble economy yeah it's interesting it's, it's an interesting economy. interesting and then we've got uh in the last one uh a classic probably my gateway into the internet aesthetic movements we've got glitch Oh boy, glitch. <laughs> that's pretty high. I mean, that's I don't know. This is this is make or break. Where's glitch going? You know, I'm gonna have to put glitch pretty high up there. I I have to almost say it. It's got its it, it's got its it's entangled in too many in too many things. I think it's it's got a lot of um it's got that rhizomatic feeling to it, you know, from you know, um Yeah, like yeah, I like I like uh the glitch aesthetic. I think we're gonna have to put that um maybe maybe at the top. <gasps> it is glitch has overtaken vaporwave. Well or mm. You guys are. This is. Bad. It's hard to choose. <laughs> you guys are bad. Yep. <laughs> hey, it's. I will say the the chat is popping off with all kinds of their own opinions about uh, aesthetics too, which is hysterical. So the chat's very <laughs> into your choice. Yes. <laughs> uh glitch. Uh, see, so now it's like this battle between glitch and vaporwave. It's a battle Sometimes between. I feel like there is a. There's at least There's a conversation. Audio. There's a conversation between glitch and vaporwave that happens. Yeah. 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 It's a dialectic. It's a dialectic, kind of like what, what 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 um what 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 um uh the Hungarian folklorist uh, Linda Day talked talked about the dialectic between belief and uh, legend. It's sort of it's like that. <laughs> That's one of my new favorite like sentences. That. Yeah. Yeah. The dialectic between glitch and vaporwave. The same as the dialect between belief and because they feel because I agree with that a hundred percent. They're twins. They're yeah. kind of like yeah. Anatos. Yeah, yeah. It makes you know, sense. Yes. Glitch mm -hmm. wakes you. You know, wakes you up out of it. So it's almost like Glitch might be the older sibling, but even though they're not like the one of them is the like. I think this might be the, these. Of, these might be three siblings here. We might have the older sibling Glitch, the like the 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 the. the the sort of ah in your face one we have the chill kind of remorseful middle child and then we have the younger child who feels like <laughs> their older siblings got all the the love and the attention and they decided to hit the vodka yeah they hit the vodka and ate a salami with their friend in the courtyard <laughs> oh boy <laughs> yeah so are we putting are we putting glitch at the top drum roll please mm. See, the problem is I probably hang out. I vibe more with vapor wave. Ooh, That's yeah. the thing. I think I'm gonna. Unfortunately, you know, I I spend, I spend time. You know, f you know, vapor wave sometimes is is music wise. It's just something. It's just a personal sort of affinity for it. Yeah. That it's it's an interesting one. Like I cook with it. You know, like I I when I'm cooking, I kind of put on a, a this vapor wave stream. Um, oh, cool. And I just kind of, it's, I. I find that a very, it puts me into an interesting space, headspace. 
I'm gonna have to probably put vaporwave still at the top. Got it. Got it. No, I I like your I like your uh, what do you call it? Your sort trying of, to uh, trying to think try to yeah. think aloud with this a little bit. Yeah. No. Yeah. I like your thought process that you had out loud there, and I I totally mm -hmm. agree. After listening to that, I think you yeah. I think you have vaporwave at the top. Um. Mm -hmm. Well. I, this is an uh, amazing tier list, and people are pointing out in the chat. You kind of go from like high, you kind of go from digital to analog. Yeah. You go from high tech to too many books, um, and a lot wow. of people are saying yeah. like I'm the exact same but backwards. Like a lot of people are saying my tier list <laughs> yeah. is the same but inverted. Thank you. Yeah. So is this is is this the whole like uh you know vaporwave funny, is dead, yeah. long live vaporwave? It, oh my yeah. god, entirely. Yeah, because. Uh, I think actually, if That's vaporwave, me. if vaporwave yeah. and, uh, and and glitch adopted a baby together, it would be future punk. Uh, uh, future funk, yeah. Future funk, yeah. Which I, I got into heavy uh, during from like work, COVID work from home. But I love this. I love this tier list on a on a okay. on a scale from vaporwave to dark academia. Um. Dark Academia. How, how well I, do you? I think, I've, I think I've vaguely, I've, I've vaguely started hearing about Dark Academia. Yeah, I just. It's different when I you haven't... are an academic. You don't want to dress like an academic. What does that mean? <laughs> dress like an academic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... There's, there's, there's yeah. a strange relationship yeah. to being that too. I mean, like, there's, it's a complicated. Um, yeah. Uh, there's some people who say. There's some people who say like, oh academic you're just being academic and then there's like academic is being like you know you're, you're striving for the best of of what we can know from knowledge you know trying to reach some understanding on a subject I yeah mean, there's something kind of like almost quaint about it there's something kind of like i don't know i learned there is a there's a splinter group called romantic that's Acad dark uh, academia except it's more goth yeah, yeah. You might be describing romantic academia, which is a splinter aesthetic I just learned about this afternoon. But yeah, yeah. I think mm. I think kind of your tier list is how, how well you want to be. Uh, your tier list kind of strikes me as uh, how how much are you like being nostalgic for the mall <laughs> from from dark uh, from vaporwave at the top to dark academia at the bottom. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I cut you off there. What were you saying? Oh, um, I'm trying to. Um trying to think about here now now you have me thinking about why did i polarize so much the the vaporwave with uh academia so this is giving me something to think you know something to, to take away from and think yeah about. it's almost well, like the they're, goal, they're the repelling the each other was but... to evoke uh yeah the goal is to evoke your your graphic art and design brain and your folklore brain in in one uh, oh, tier list, okay. and so we hope we hope that this was a satisfying intellectual exercise. <laughs> you guys are such you're you're so you're you're you guys are so thoughtful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh. I really didn't know what to. I tried to really come in. You know, I didn't have any. You know, I kept. I came in open minded, so I didn't know what was going to happen out of this. And I, I think you guys have just been such, such great, um, very kind hosts. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor G. You know, uh, like like Daisy likes to say, uh, we'd 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 be doing we'd be doing this if no one was watching. This is just fun for us to have these conversations and to. And to uh, you know exercise yeah. that academic parts of our brain with, through uh, while talking about like video games and stuff on the internet. So uh, yeah. yeah, I mean well, like I've, I've met uh, I met Daisy I think out uh, you know I've met Daisy before so I've gotten to know her a little bit mm -hmm. um, and then Don yeah. this is our chance to really meet each other so this is a very nice balance. This is Thank you. Um, I, I really look forward to um, yeah. you know catching up with both of you. Yeah, um, yeah, and. So I think this is about yeah. that time you have a you gotta uh, swing by a swing by our um I was gonna say you guys you gotta swing by our like all gas no breaks setup at AFS this year. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting yes. out in the lobby, we're gonna keep interviewing people. Streaming as they live walk from AFS. Okay. 